And uh, Steve is currently a PhD student in the Dyson School of Engineering at Imperial College London. He graduated from the University of Oxford in 2019 uh, with first grade uh, class honors in material science and a master degree in chemomechanical modeling of super alloy deformation. Steve then started a PhD fellowship with Faraday Institute and uh, institution and focusing on uh, the application of machine learning methods for battery electrical design. He currently published, he recently published an article in Nature Machine Intelligence describing a method for synthesizing uh, 3D microstructure from 2D slides with generative adversarial uh, networks. He is interested in uh, image processing, tool development, and the materials uh, optimization. So, uh, Steve, the floor is yours. Start your okay, presentation. Yeah, right. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Um, and can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. Great, thank you for the intro and thanks for those talks as well. Super interesting. So um, I think also Hongbo has introduced this a little bit, the different scales that we think about batteries on um, and definitely with a much nicer slide than, than mine is. Ooh, that's weird. Um, so as, uh, as Juna said, I, um, um, I work with the Faraday Institution and uh, specifically I'm in the multi-scale modeling uh, di division. And more specifically than that, I look at the structural scale of batteries. So how we can um, try to understand the performance of a battery based on its microstructure. So in this talk, I'm gonna start off by just describing why we care about that, why we care about the microstructure of batteries at all. Uh, and then I'm gonna discuss a, a slice scan, which is a method for taking a single 2D cross section of a, of a material and statistically generating 3D volumes for modeling purposes and for optimization. Okay, so first things first, why do we care about the, the microstructure of electrodes in batteries? So this here is a very basic uh, representation of what an electrode might look like and specifically a cathode, uh, the positive, the positive uh, anode of, uh, sorry, the, po the positive electrode of a battery. You can see here, there are three main phases. The black is porous material, the gray is active material and the white is binder. So during the charging and discharge of a, well, during the discharge of a battery, we have lithium ions diffusing through that porous material, uh, reaching the surface of the active material and then intercalating, which we've heard about quite a bit today as well. Um, so the, the structural arrangement of these different phases really strongly influences the actual performance of our battery. So for example, the more porous our, mater our, our ma um, material is, the easier it is for that lithium to penetrate into the, into the cathode, and therefore the faster we can, uh, we can discharge, and that means higher rates of power. So, and, but conversely, the more porous we are, the less active material we have, and the lower, the lower, accessible, um, sorry, the lower capacity our batteries can have. So there's some really complicated interplay, like interplays between different uh, microstructural properties of, of cathodes that we want to try and understand so that we can optimize that performance for a particular use case. So my project specifically has been about um, looking at how we can go from single 2D images such as this on the right and, and generate 3D volumes such as this on the left. And the reason we really want to do this is you can see from this image here that a lot of 3D uh, imaging techniques are really limited in their resolution. We can't resolve phases like the binder, which is this, this phase over here that holds those particles together very well. Um, and what that means is that we lose a lot of really important information about how our microstructure affects our behavior. So my, my challenge has been how can we go from these high resolution 2D representations of a material and try to reconstruct 3D volumes such as this. And so just as a bit, little bit of a background, there are a lot of current methods that are already out there for trying to do this. It's a long standing project a pro problem because it is it would be very useful to solve. Um, so one of those methods is feature extraction and then there are various different reconstruction, reconstruction algorithms we can use. So what this entails is essentially, if I have an image like this of grains, I can do some analysis on it. So extract like a grain size distribution, uh, the, uh, some orientation analysis of what, what direction the, um, these grain structures are, uh, and look at like grain boundary misorientation. So I could, I could extract any, any, any number of features like that from my image, and then use some reconstruction techniques in order to go, in order to make, try to generate a 3D volume that has those same properties as that 2D micrograph. 
But one of the big, well, there are a couple of big limitations to this approach. One of them is I, as the human, have to decide what are the important statistical features that I'm going to extract and try to keep constant. Um, and I also, I have to choose what type of reconstruction algorithm I'm going to use. And all of those human decisions that are different from one microstructure to, a net, to the next bring in a lot of uh, bring in a lot of error and inconsistency between one between one approach to uh, sorry between one ex experiment to the next um, and like they obviously also instill a level of uh, human bias of what we expect is important and we may miss things that are important that the human just can't tell we can't tell that those statistical features are important whether they're important or not on top of that it's very hard to capture complicated uh complicated features from from this for example like the shape of these the shape of these grains might be very difficult to capture in a single statistical analysis um, if we have very complicated shapes. We also have things like two point correlation analysis, which do um, is slightly similar, except it, uh, well, yeah, quite similar, except that the feature that we use is a two point correlation analysis, two point correlation function, and that's the only statistical feature that's used for optimize it for trying to reconstruct these images. And a two point correlation analysis essentially just uh, is a is a function that describes the probability of finding the same phase at some distance away from a given pixel. So here you can see we have a high probability of finding black pixels right next to black pixels, which kind of makes sense because they're clumped together. Um, and then we tend towards, well, not here because it's a normalized two point correlation function. And again, the main downside of this approach is that where there's a lot of degeneracy within these structures. So a single, this is if this is my only statistical descriptor for this material, then a lot of information is lost um, during this compression, which means that when I go to reconstruct something 3D, it's again, not a particularly, uh, we, we don't have a very high level of faith that the features from 2D were not lost in during this compression of information. So on that note, what's the approach that I've been trying to trying to develop in order to combat some of those limitations? Well, we're using deep convolutional nets to start with, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this. So deep convolutional nets are very good for uh, feature extraction, for, um, for example, classification, as is given in this example here. Uh, because they can very efficiently detect features within an image using these kernels or, or filters. In, in, in particular, I'm going to use a technique called generative adversarial nets, which essentially uses two of those convolutional networks. This one up at the, on the top right is called a discriminator, and it takes in, sorry, yeah, this one's called a discriminator. On the bottom left, we have a generator, which is like an inverted classifier in that it takes in some random noise and generates an image. And so the goal of this technique in general, generative adversarial nets, is to try and create fake images. So for example, this has been done very extensively with faces um, and all manners of other, other types of uh, image where we can create, we can, we can use a training set that includes real faces and our generator learns to um, copy those real faces and create realistic looking images. In this case, I'm doing the same thing, but with microstructure. And to start with, this example is just showing 2D, um, the 2D case. So here I have a 2D training set my generator makes a 2D instance, we compare them in this discriminator, and then my discriminator tries to tell the difference between these two images, and my generator tries to make the, the fake image look as much like it comes from this real distribution as possible. And we iteratively go through that process and eventually we end up with something very good, something very good looking like this. So what's the problem? Why can't I take these 2D images and use them to use them to generate 3D microstructures directly? Well, there's a dimensionality and compatibility there because this discriminator specifically takes in 2D images, which means that if my generator made a 3D volume, it, it would simply reject that. It cannot, it cannot compare 3D volumes to 2D volumes. So what SliceScan does, which is the algorithm I've been developing, is instead of passing this 3D volume in directly, I take a bunch of slices in each direction of my 3D volume and then compare those 2D slices to my, to my 2D training data. So instead of my instead of G trying to make a realistic um, 3D volume specifically, it's trying to make a 3D volume that contains realistic looking 2D slices. And that allows us to solve that dimensionality and compatibility. So here are some of the results. This is actually a separator material from 
uh, the, the separator essentially sits between anode and cathode. Um, this is the only training image that was inputted in order to get this in order to get this uh, volume out here. Actually, sorry, that's not correct. There were a couple of these. The, this is a this is a smaller sample. I think the actual training image is probably four times bigger than this. But that in itself was able to reconstruct this three D um, this three D volume. And not only that, but um, so one single two D slice can can generate these volumes and the amount of time it takes to actually make one of these volumes is like sub seconds it's incredibly fast to generate these three these 3d um, structures and obviously it's very convenient only having to take a 2d slide to a single 2d image as opposed to having to try and image these these materials in 3d here's an example of a perovskite where I think this is um, yeah Kelvin for, Kelvin probe force microscopy. So uh, this is just I actually this was actually given to me by um, someone who randomly emailed me asking whether it would work. I took this image in as it was, passed it into my passed it into my algorithm, and this is what pops out. Very nice again. Um, and this is for the actual lithium cathode that I was showing earlier. Um, and on the left we have the training data, and on the right we have an example of uh, my generated volume. And you can see, so, so in this case on the left, we did have a 3D um, data for, for um, as my, sorry, I do have 3D data available, but I only used a single 2D slice of it to train this 3D, to train my generators to make this 3D volume on the right. And the nice thing about that is that I can then do some statistical comparisons between the real 3D data and my fake generated 3D data. Um, and what we find is that in general, in terms of our, in terms of some key microstructural properties, these um, the slice scan and the real data have very similar statistical properties in general. So, for example, here I'm comparing volume fraction. Uh, this is volume fraction of pore, which is the black active, which is the gray, and binder, which is the white. And you can see these fit these statistical distributions fit relatively well. Um, in the middle, this green bar is showing a case of the three D to three D. So, when if I use three D um, instances of this training image to train a 3D GAN, how does it perform versus when I only use 2D, for example, in slice GAN, um, how, how do the features differ there? And you can see again, 3D versus 2D, they perform very well. Um, but this isn't necessarily the most impressive of, this of the metrics to, to examine because volume fraction is, um, we expect it to behave the same in 2D as, as 3D. So what we're more interested in is something like tortuosity, which is an inherently 3D metric because it's about how, so tortuosity is about how easy it is for the lithium ions to percolate into the, um, into the cathode. And so this is what we really care about because the, the, question, the key question we're trying to ask is can we reconstruct 3D, uh, can we accurately calculate 3D properties from just a 2D slice that has, that has been expanded into three dimensions? And again, we uh, our statistics say they agree relatively well. Um, and the last nice thing to say is that we can. So this is a, actually a three D. This is actually a three D volume. We can make huge, huge samples bigger than you could ever sample in um, in like a in a classic three D imaging using a classic three D imaging technique. And again, this takes incredible. This is incredibly fast. I can just pass in. I change the function of my generator very slightly, and it can create any dimension um, object I want. It can also generate things with periodic boundaries very easily, and there are a load of very nice, flexible um, features of the generator. And yeah, so happily, we've just published this with this pretty front, pretty front cover. Um, it's in, it's available in archive and about to come out in Nature Machine Intelligence tomorrow. I think it's going to publish. Um, okay, so very quickly, I'm actually not 100% sure what time. What time? Someone will have to let me know if I'm if I'm running over. But I'm ju just quickly also wanted to talk about microstructural exp exploration. So one of the nice things that we can do is once we have our generator G, which is making these nice realistic 3D volumes, instead of just inputting a random noise vector, I can search that. Not I can search. So this random noise vector essentially determines the final features in my image. But instead of inputting something random, I can try and explore the space of possible microstructures in an informed way. I'm not going to show this image because I'm not sure whether the um, whether I'm allowed to play YouTube videos. But um, so instead of just having a random Z input, I can generate an image, calculate some property from that image, for example, volume fraction or tortuosity, and then update Z in a way 
um, update Z iteratively to try to to try to maximize that material property for whatever for for whatever uh, purpose I want. So I could, for example, try to maximize tortuosity or try to maximize volume fraction or surface area of this material. Um, and so this is a little animation showing what happens when we do that. So you can see here I've specifically tried, I've, I've gone for an experiment where I'm trying to create like a graded electrode where this, uh, the, X, the Y axis is um, porosity and the X axis is depth through this material. So I'm trying to make a low, about 40% porosity on the left-hand side and about 50% uh, porosity on the right-hand side. And you can see that by exploring the space of Z, I can find a particular instance of microstructure that suits what I want. And then I could explore how that influences properties um, in whatever way I wanted. Um, yeah, so this is just saying that, unfortunately, if we do a free optimization and don't care about how realistic this looks, we can sometimes find non-realistic features within our, within our microstructure. And to get around that, I can do a more constrained optimization where I also include uh, the discriminator's evaluation of how realistic this sample is in my loss function. So now I'm trying to not just obtain these obtain these these uh, values. I'm also trying to make sure that that image remains realistic while I go through that optimization process. Um, and this is just a close up, just to show you exactly what what's happening. All I'm doing is changing z that input vector, and it's creating these. Um, it's changing the like volume fraction here to try and fit what I've told it to try and be. Um, and again, that whole optimization process takes a matter of minutes. Um, yeah, so with that, I think that's all from me. And um, just to say, this is all open, freely available that, um, in a GitHub repo. It's essentially, it's a very basic process to use it. So I encourage people, I, I actually just had someone email me for the first time saying they've used it without me looking at it, which was, which was quite nice. Um, it's very basic to use. All you need to do is pass in a 2D image, um, tell it what type of image that is, the data type, um, the path to your image, and then you can change these settings, but all of the data I've shown you has used the same settings for the um, arch for the network architectures. And then you just run it. And it's really as simple as that. The algorithm does everything else for you. So hopefully someone will find that useful. And thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you, Steve. This is very, very good. And uh, actually, I have a question. So do you have any plan to think about the, the carbon black and binders to accurately capture those, those additional features? Yeah, so one of the main reasons why it's uh, we, we do. So there's a couple of, that, that is kind of like the image, the slide I showed you at the very start, obviously we haven't got there yet. And there, there's a couple of main limitations to getting there. One of them is memory and like what it requires to, gen, to generate something to like have that high resolution in my GAN. Um, but we are essentially working on doing some upscale, on doing some upscaling alongside the, alongside slice GAN so that you can try and capture those actually really high resolutions. Um, there's the other issue with that is that you need what slice scan uses like a cross section which means that it needs to be flat effectively and we're also working with some people on some methods for like impregnating cathodes so that you can get a perfectly flat surface and that will massively help the, the our ability to do that i think that second one is actually the main issue memory we, memory we're getting around using like the imperial supercomputers now it's 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 fine but <laughs> the issue of needing a perfectly flat, flat surface is quite a challenge mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm asking because I'm a potential user. <laughs> so, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> send me some and images. I would love to. You know, like I, I, we've, I've pretty consistently. For me, it's like someone sends me an image. I put it into the algorithm. The next day, you have a solution and you send it back. It's just like so easy to try relative to like having to prepare a three D sample and having to do that every time you you know you want to change some settings on your in your microstructure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great to know. To know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so probably we can just start uh, start with some some discussion. Uh, I mean, there is a pan panel discussion session. So uh, I actually prepared some 